Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Fleet Europe webinar sponsored by Andex, entitled Absorb 95 Grams CO2 Market Disruptions in 2020. Before we start, I would like to point out that the information shared within this webinar is subject to disclaimers, which can be viewed in detail via the recording of this session, which will be shared on fleeteurope.com. My name is Dieter Quartier. I am Fleet Europe's journalist for the domains New Energies, Connected and Remarketing, and I have the pleasure of hosting this webinar, which will tell you some very interesting things about the 95 gram CO2 target that takes effect in 2021. OEMs selling cars in the EU that do not reach their targets by 2021 will have to pay hefty, pi hefty fines. However, they will be able to reduce their fleet averages and thus their fines by gaining super credits for the sale of plug-in hybrids and battery electric vehicles from 2020 onwards. That is why they will be pushing electric and plug-in hybrids into the market as from next year. And that, of course, means big challenges for importers, dealers, but also opportunities in the sourcing and the remarketing department. Ladies and gentlemen, you have registered to learn more about this. And without further ado, let me introduce to you the experts of today's webinar. First up is Matthias Pop, Global VP Testing Services of Business Line Transportation at SGS. In about 15 minutes from now, our second speaker, Tom Knapkins, CEO and founder of Andex, will do his part of today's webinar. I'm sure that you will have lots of questions during and after Mr. Pops and Mr. Knapkins' presentations. We kindly remind you that you can always ask these questions through the chat function of this webinar. We will gather your questions so they can be treated afterwards during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Also for your information, we will not mention any names of the people who are asking questions, so you can feel free to ask any question you uh, like. Mr. Matthias Pop, thank you for joining us and you are hereby invited to take the floor. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to the audience about uh, the influence of the WLTP transitions and uh, the fleet average uh, regulations. As many of you are aware about uh, that uh, we had already a transition of the WLTP in the September 18th and 19th. And uh, we have seen various effects. And uh, on that slide, you see headlines in the various newspapers. Uh, how those kind of uh, changes of the uh, driving cycle measurement of uh, CO2 limits and other exhaust uh, emissions have changed um, in, in, in recent time, uh, the values. And uh, that brings effect also to the registration. That is uh, what we wanted to talk about. Next slide, please. So here, what you see on that slide is uh, the effect, what I call the black Septembers in Germany, okay? These are numbers from Germany. Uh, on the y-axis, you see uh, the number of registrations per month and on the x, you see the months of each year, of the years. And um, so you see the different years, 17, 18, and uh, 19. And you see these uh, declines of sales numbers uh, in the Septembers uh, when the new WLTP um, regulations took effect for every car which was sold from the 1st of September 18 onwards and 19 onwards. So you see the effect has uh, shown also that in October the sales picked up again, um, but those kind of effects uh, are the ones which are disrupting also the pipeline in used car sales and that's the reason why we want to talk about this today. Uh, when you look at the average CO2 in the fleets uh, between 18 and 19, uh, you see actually an increase of about 18.7% in the fleet in Germany. Um, that is due to the fact that the WLTP is a drive cycle which um, measures the whole emissions a little bit different. It's longer, higher speed, 
and other influences influence the CO2. And therefore, you see this increase of 18.7% versus the old cycle. Next slide, please. So when you look at the years here, um, you see on the, on the y-axis, the new vehicle CO2 uh, grams per kilometer. And uh, until the year 2020, you see the so-called NDAC, this is the old cycle for testing CO2. Um, and then uh, the grams um, uh, limit by 2021 for the fleets on average is 95 grams. And that is uh, the average, as I say, uh, across uh, uh, all the cars. Uh, however, that average uh, is uh, compensated also and corrected for each OEM by the weight of the fleet. Uh, so the average uh, European fleet weight is 1.379 tons, 1,379 kilograms. So for, for fleets which are way above that one, uh, the, the average is corrected by for 100 kilograms, 3.33 grams CO2 more. So if your fleet exceeds it by 100 kilograms, so you're not looking at 95 grams, you're looking at 98.33 grams, for example. Um, and the other influence is here now that uh, you will have this increase of CO2 because of the WLTP limit, which is about, as I said in the, earlier, in the previous slide, 18% above. So an average is between 15 and 25% above. So it's, it's rising actually uh, from uh, that uh, influence, from that value uh, to the where you see the orange uh, arrow going up, the new regulations from the EU now says that uh, the fleet has to come down the average by 15 percent per OEM um, in the year 25 and 37.5 uh, percent from that new equivalent WLTP limit in 2030. So it's defined as a relative. The uh, reduction of CO2 versus an absolute in the old days where it was called 95 grams. So the limits for 25 and the limits for 30 will be defined individually for each OEM. Next slide, please. So to compensate for all that, you know, there are some possibilities now to move into electric vehicles. Um, and you, here you see. Uh, what the influence is uh, when uh, the production targets, which are planned now for the coming years for each OEM are really met. Um, so in this case, uh, I see on the left-hand side, FCA and Tesla who have pooled their fleets together, where FCA has a CO2 limit because they are mostly combustion engine based and Tesla has no CO2 whatsoever. So when you put this together, um, they actually uh, will have uh, a positive influence and therefore they are about 8% uh, above what they need to avoid penalties. And similarly, uh, Nissan, Toyota, especially Toyota, Mazda pooling together their um, hybrid fleets and Volvo and so on, uh, you know, they're all in the green. Then uh, when you look at some uh, Renault group, for example, they are a little bit in the, in the middle section and uh, BAT are currently PSA, Volkswagen, BMW, and Ford. They are in Hyundai and so on to the right of the picture. They are actually uh, not getting there to avoid any penalties. This is the current situation based on data of the OEMs where they say which, uh, well, which amount of sales they will achieve with their electric vehicles. Next slide, please. So the major influence on this whole thing is actually the super credits. Uh, what is that? Um, it's very simple. Until the end of 2019, 31st of December, every electric vehicle or uh, low carbon vehicle like a plug-in hybrid, which has less than 50 grams CO2 per kilometer, uh, will count only one. From 2020 onwards, 1st of January, if the same vehicle is sold, you get a double. So this is called the super credits, which should, the, the purpose of these super credits is to incentivize the OEMs to sell electric cars into the, into the market. Um, also that super credit is reduced in the year 21 to a factor of 1.66 and in 22 to a factor of 1.33. And from 23 onwards, there is no more super credit. Uh, this is the major influence why currently we see in the in the in the market 
that you actually have no chance to buy uh, electric vehicles which are you know customized and everything else maybe only from the lots if there are some uh, but uh, build to order has currently three to 12 months lead time um, and mostly uh, the OEMs are selling these cars and registering these cars then from the 1st of January to gain those kind of super credit. Next slide, please. So uh, transportenvironment.org has uh, calculated now and summed up all the different cars which are announced, the BEV models and the plug-in hybrid models of all the different manufacturers. So this is a very busy slide, but you see here on the left, the different OEMs and the color codes for those. And you see that huge jump of models being available in the market uh, from 2020 onwards. And then you see that the slope of that increase of models uh, is again decreasing after 2020. So um, that's another very um, you know, simple way to see this, uh, that uh, the super credits kick in in 2020 is um, uh, uh, influencing mar the marking a lot in this sense. Next slide, please. Sometimes you get the questions uh, in fleet managers, diesel engines, where are they? Is there a renaissance to this? One thing is for true that the new diesel engines which are out there have actually uh, after treatment, which is much better than it was before, and they're reaching all the NOx levels um, in, in the tests and also in real drive emission tests when you test the emissions at the, at the exhaust uh, while you drive a drive cycle. Um, the thing is only uh, that um, uh, there's a lot of after treatment necessary and new technology, which is cost prohibitive for the A and B segments. Uh, some of the technology which is used is faster reaching operation temperatures from cold starts by having the after treatment devices much closer to the manifold. Uh, but that needed a lot of reconstruction of the, of the engine architectures. And then you have uh, operation modes with sailing mode and uh, the, the operation mode normally is below the 250 and the, the 250 the cat has to lead to reach to, to be effective to, to sort out the NOx and to filter the NOx. So uh, the B turbo is also there for faster, re faster reaching operational temperatures for the cold start. So all these new features are costing money and the, the bottom line is that's cost prohibitive to the A and B segment. Um, so you won't see the, the typical uh, small A segment diesel cars anymore with 1.6 liter diesel. Um, you see also that some OEMs are now drastically moving towards electrification in that segment uh, to avoid even normal gas engines in that segment. Next slide, please. So also there are tax incentives, as you all know, um, and you see that some of the tax, tax incentives have uh, actually reduced big time the CO2 emissions in certain countries like Denmark or the Netherlands, Malta and Portugal. Um, you see this in the slide here. Um, on the other high side, it will lead also to some distortions in the market. Um, uh, there is actually a law plant in Germany, if it passes all the different uh, 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 steps in the legislation, uh, it will lead to a big distortion in the market uh, because Germany plans to lower the taxable uh, income for corporate cars to 25% of the taxable income of the same uh, if it's a diesel or a gas engine. Uh, that is drastic. You know, so just give you an example, if you have a 60,000 uh, euro car in Germany as a corporate car, you're getting taxed uh, per uh, month 600 euros taxable income. Uh, if that's an electric car, in the, if the electric car is actually below 40,000 value, that's the limit until this uh, uh, regulation will take uh, effect, uh, you will actually pay only 25% of that. So in case of a 40,000 euro car, you're getting taxed not 400 euros for the couple of months, but only 100. You know, you can imagine what that distorts in the market and how when these fleets of all these electric vehicles come back and have to be sold, that will influence the market big time. Next one. Next slide, okay. Uh, so what are the countermeasures? The countermeasures are uh, sales steering, and uh, this has to be done by a dealership. So the OEMs are, are looking exactly in what is sold currently in the market. Uh, they will tell their dealerships most likely now 
uh, that to withhold all the sales of electric vehicles until end of the, this year and then start kicking in in the in 1st of January. Uh, the pricing also will be used for, for reducing the CO2 gap as much as possible. And uh, there is actually a new regulation, but I didn't show you that one now because after 24, uh, there will be also a tax and not tax, uh, there will be super credit like incentives for the OEMs to sell BEVs and plug in hybrids in so called so set left countries, uh, which will most likely as well lead to some day registration in those countries of electric vehicles and PEVs. Um, and this is all, and we will see how this success, how this is successfully, and these measures actually are implemented in the next years onwards. So that's all for me. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthias Pop, for uh, your presentation. Before we move on to uh, Mr. Tom Knapkin's presentation, mm -hmm. I would uh, like to remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that if you have questions for Matthias Pop, please feel free to use the chat function. Um, we will assemble the questions after the webinar and respond to them during the Q&A session. Mr. Tom Knapkins, may I invite you to tell us more about the remarketing challenges that are linked to the 2020 and the 20. Uh, 21 market disruption and the solutions that are available. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. The main goal of my presentation is not to give you a sales pitch on my company, but to talk about car traders on a global scale and how these companies uh, can help OEMs and uh, uh, car dealers and so on with these market disruptions. First of all, market disruptions are always present in our business. Uh, a few years ago, we went to, from Euro 5 uh, to Euro 6 with all the disruptions that uh, went ahead. Dieselgate was a brutal switch from diesel to uh, petrol, which uh, we have to cope uh, as well. And now we're heading for the 95 gram per kilogram CO2. So car dealers, OEMs and uh, short-term rental companies have to cope with these uh, changes and that within the different countries within the EU because every country will have its different uh, CO2 objective as uh, mentioned by the previous speaker. Can I have the next slide please? First of all, uh, to understand trading companies, we have to make the difference between trading companies and brokers. Brokers are uh, very disruptive to the market because these companies never eff effectively buy cars. They pretty much operate as middlemen with no guarantee uh, to you as a supplier, uh, to discretion, to market disturbance, residual value and financial strength. They uh, usually send bulk mails all over Europe and then they start buying cars which they have sold. They even put cars on LinkedIn which is not good for residual value for market image and so on. And last but not least, they uh, lose or no compliance whatsoever with VAT rules, which is very dangerous when it comes to cross-border sales. Can I have the next slide, please? A trading company, on the, on the other hand, only sells cars which are being, have been purchased by this company and paid for, and usually are already in their storage park. They can do that because they have the necessary financial funding, cash, to uh, cope with these bigger volumes. Discretion for these companies is key because you don't want your uh, cars, your excess stock cars, popping up all over Europe, popping up all over the internet, and so on. These companies, they dispose of multilingual uh, teams, so they can travel all over Europe to buy the cars and to start selling them in a discreet way. Last but not least, these companies, they excel in uh, their operation because they usually follow up on a very good scale, the documents, the transport, and everything which comes to car sales. Next slide, please. Trading companies, they can uh, buy excess stock of stock cars which are already have been produced and which are standing on parking lot or they can engage themselves into factory orders in the country uh, where these cars are not selling as good as uh, thought by the OEM. 
they operate on a worldwide uh, base, which means that the cars that have been sold to trading companies never harm the local mar markets because they simply leave the country without ever coming back, which has which is a, a guarantee then for the residual value in the country of origin. They have strict respect for the VAT regulations, so the risk of uh, cross-border cross sales and VAT risk is uh, gone. And last but not least, uh, this is a new and reliable distribution channel, channel, uh, channel. It has been proved for because one of the biggest trading companies in France has now uh, an OEM in his shareholder structure. So uh, trading companies can be a solution within many for disruptions in the market. Thank you, Dieter. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. And uh, I'm sure the participants have already learned a lot, um, but I'm also sure they have uh, some questions left. Um, so, um, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a question, please do not hesitate to ask uh, either of our experts, Tom Knapkins or Matthias Pop. Um, and that brings us to the final part of this webinar, the Q&A session. And um, let me just kick off with a question for uh, Matthias Pop. Um, the CO2 target for OEMs is corrected based on the, the vehicle weight. Um, one of the attendants wants to know whether that means that brands like Mercedes uh, BMW are in a more favorable position there than, for example, Citroën and Fiat. Uh, which mainly build smaller, lighter cars. Yeah, that's uh, clearly the fact. Uh, the, the compensation by weight uh, was introduced after a lot of negotiations between the European Commission and the OEMs. Um, uh, and it led to a situation where um, heavy uh, vehicle fleets, uh, especially uh, uh, on SUV-based uh, fleets uh, uh, like uh, Jaguar Land Rover and others uh, got a very high limit actually and um, uh, so there is some distortion in the market in this regard. Uh, mm -hmm. We see that clearly um, but this was negotiated after length time between the different stakeholders um, and uh, from that point of view this is a fact which uh, everybody in the market currently has to live with. Uh, the, the importance there is that also the starting point as I said of the um, of the um, uh, limit for each OEM fleet is very important because uh, the reduction is now uh, defined as a percentage of 15% reduction by 25 and 37.5% by 2030. Uh, so the starting point of of that is also relevant. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, one more question for um, Mr. Tom Knapkins. Um, in which vehicle segments do you believe there will be an oversupply next year and why? I think in the first few months of next year there will be uh, an oversupply of uh, cars with a pretty high CO2 which are being registered now in this period because next year they won't be very interesting for OEMs. So they have to go with day registrations now to put them on the market and next year because then they won't face penalties. And on the other, other hand, as already mentioned, electric vehicles and low emission uh, plug-in hybrids will be very interesting for OEMs uh, to cope with regulation. So I think there will be uh, some oversupply of these cars as well order to go with the, the penalties. Yeah, all right, thank you. Um, I've got a question for uh, Matthias. The uh, EU guidelines are currently directed toward OEMs. Um, would you see this uh, further evolving uh, towards vehicle leasing uh, organizations um, beyond subsidized uh, capital available for finance? Um, a little bit difficult to, to answer that one. Um, so definitely 
when you look at that, the 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 um, uh, I would say that the the influence on the on the fleets or the leasing fleets were very similar as in the private market, but in the leasing fleets they have to think about what's coming back later on. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, uh, uh, therefore they have to they have to uh, they will face a, a situation when some of these tax incentives, as I mentioned, for example, in Germany, where your taxable income is only uh, uh, taken into account of the corporate card at 25% compared to a combustion engine, you will see that everybody wants to have now electric vehicles if they if they fit their use, okay? And these cars will come back after two years or three years. Mm -hmm. The question then is, is the market taking these cars? Because there's no tax incentive for the typical used car say, a buyer, okay? This tax incentive is only for, for the corporate um, Dienstwagen fahrer, as we say in Germany, the corporate uh, car um, guys, you know? Yeah. So. That will be difficult in the future, in my point of view. Yeah, yeah. I have a follow-up question on this. Um, how possible um, is it possible that fines could already uh, be influencing retail prices? I think that's an interesting question. Um, have you, for instance, already noticed higher than normal price updates uh, for the the coming model years, or do you believe that could be the case, Matthias? Mr. Mr. Matthias Bock, please. Uh, okay, that's a good question for me, but I'm more the guy who is doing testing stuff, you see, but I know <laughs> that I know that uh, what Tom mentioned earlier, that uh, the high um, emission uh, models, uh, uh, you know, the typical 300 uh, horsepower uh, golf type car uh, are currently discounted immensely. Yeah, you see that as a distortion as far as I can see it currently, but Tom, you might be able to answer that probably more competently. Uh, we are seeing now that we can do deals on cars with high CO2 emissions. Uh, so they are, as you, as you mentioned, they are giving higher uh, discounts on these cars already. And I think, but I, I do not know it for sure, but I think uh, that the, the question is interesting. And I think that the prices of um, these, these cars, they, 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 they will go uh, up next next year, yes, in order to uh, put the, the, the final customer to more interesting and low emission cars. Yeah, um, another question, Tom, for you. Um, do you think that the brands will start steering the, their sales? And for instance, limit the availability of high CO2 uh, cars and try to push the, the low CO2 cars, um, the ones that emit less than 50 grams, because that's the, the threshold value to get the super credits. Do you think that's, that's going to be the, the case next year? That they will uh, start pushing low uh, emission vehicles. I think they will be pushing them, as already mentioned, in the price settings to the retail price, but also in volume driven bonuses to their uh, different dealerships. So dealers will be intensified as well uh, to sell the low emission vehicles. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And are you aware of a dealership being incentivized like like this already um, in terms of model mix, um, powertrain mix, uh, so that the, the, the importers on the one hand and of course the OEMs uh, in first instance they can steer the, the market. Uh, these uh, bonuses on low emission vehicles. Do not count yet for, for this year, which is clear, but they are putting everything in place already uh, to start doing this uh, from, for next, from next year on in order to push the dealers to start selling these cars more than uh, the cars which, uh, which have a, a CO2 which is too high. Yeah. It's already next year, but it's not uh, applicable yet. It is logic. Yeah. Um, another question is more about the remarketing side. Um, how do OEMs ensure that the cars that they are selling and, and perhaps registering and then uh, selling outside the EU or to other markets, how can they make sure that they're not coming back to the, to the local markets? It all depends on the, the uh, 
why on realty of your trading company you're trading with those companies uh, as mine we put everything uh, we can in order to avoid these cars coming back we never propose them in the com country of, of uh, origin um, never sell to uh, end customers as well only to uh, resellers who sell at sell in their uh, businesses to end customers mm -hmm. but you don't 100 percent guarantee uh, to this which is clear you can only put in uh, some safety me measures in how you, you uh, do your business yeah yeah talking about um, um, procurement opportunities Tom I have a question um, to which extent do uh, OEMs allow trading companies to? Um, uh, how to which extent do they allow uh, large fleet operators to purchase stocks at uh, international level? Because if there's so much pressure on putting enough EVs on the market and plug-in hybrids on the market, well, I'm sure many leasing companies would be interested to come into contact with companies like uh, like yours. Uh, these companies are not our customers. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't want to interfere with the OEMs, you see. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the, the cars that we buy, the deals are never negotiated on an OEM level. They are mostly negotiated on an importer or dealer level. The importer is always uh, aware of the deals which are going on. Uh, but dealer has to wants to do a deal with us he, he always needs his important his importer because the, the, the uh, he has to be able to give the discount and therefore he will be needing this importer yeah necessarily the OEM mm -hmm. all right um, Matthias I have a question for you um, do you believe that these fines will actually be enforced uh, upon the OEMs, and if so, will, could that mean the, the possible bankruptcy of a uh, of of the, the few smaller OEMs? No, uh, that the enforcement of those uh, of those penalties is clear. You know that will be done. Um, the the extent of those kind of uh, penalties has been estimated by various studies, and. Um, uh, so they are not in the level that they can actually bankrupt somebody, you know, a big OEM. I don't foresee that, um, but I can, um, but I, I, it's a serious blow to their bottom line, okay? So in the worst case scenario, some of the OEMs who actually are way behind currently, and I, I put those on the slides here and the studies there, um, uh, they can uh, face a situation where in Europe they probably make only half of the profit anymore, so they will halve their margins in percentage. Um, so that's what, what is currently foreseen in the market. Yeah, all right. I have a question uh, regarding uh, the Chinese OEMs, um, talking about uh, uh, BYD, um, Bogor, etc. How are they affected by the, the, the fines? I mean, being such a small company, uh, which rules do apply to the, the smaller ones? The rules uh, for the smaller ones uh, are actually, ex there are exemptions for a certain uh, amount of sales. Um, I think it's, uh, uh, I think I have to look it up exactly what it is, uh, like 10,000 or something or 5,000 cars a year, you're exempt from that. On the other hand, the, the, the manufacturers you mentioned, they will not sell combustion engine cars. You know, BYD will sell electric cars. And uh, similarly, some of the other uh, startup companies or not actually startup companies, but some of these major uh, EV OEMs coming from, from, from China entering into the market. And the first uh, of those brands have been homologated and type approved for Europe. I'm not mentioning any names here, but. Uh, these guys will most likely pool their their credits then with uh, with some of the combustion engine guys. So I don't foresee that the Chinese will enter the European market with combustion engine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another question for you, uh, Matthias. On the one hand, we see the the enforcement by the EU in the shape of, uh, of fines. On the other hand, there's something like incentiv incentivization. 
um, for the, the large corporates. Um, do you think that big corporations are motivated enough to switch their company cars to plug-in hybrids and, and battery electric vehicles in, uh, in 2020? And what is your opinion on um, the motivation they should, should get to do so? Um, I think, you know, when you look at the different companies, they have company car uh, uh, regulations and uh, many of the companies have enforced that now on the green car, green car policies and they have uh, incentivized their employees um, to buy and to get only corporate cars uh, below a certain CO2 limit, like our company does the same. So uh, there is already some some enforcement uh, in the on the company side because they have to fulfill sustainability um, requirements uh, uh, because uh, they want to sell their services or their products and then uh, many other companies make that dependent on how what kind of green car policies you have as a as a as a company not only as an OEM but as a company you know so I can see that this is pushed down. Uh, into the fleet managers and the fleet managers will insist that the people are buying more plug-in hybrids and the full electric vehicles. If the German uh, legislation comes into effect, uh, which I mentioned before, uh, which is only taxing 25% of the taxable income for electric vehicles, but this is only applicable for electric vehicles, full electric vehicles below 40,000 euros book or you know, normal list price. Now you can imagine what pressure that puts on the OEMs. That means the the big cars, uh, the 50 to 80,000 euro corporate cars, EVs, will not be actually sold in the market. Yeah. Everybody will go for the, for the, I don't mention our company, but for the one which has been launched recently and will be launched by the 1st of January in big numbers. This company is pushing this car into a segment about 400,000 cars a year. Yeah. And they will outsell. They will outsell the SUV type EVs by big numbers. Mm. But this is all distortion because of, ta of of taxation rules in Germany. I don't yeah. know. I don't watch it so much in the Netherlands or in in other countries in Europe. But um, I guess that these tax rules will greatly influence the market. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I have another one for you, uh, Matthias. Corporate fleet. Uh, policies are driven by CO2 caps. However, it is uh, hard to select the right cars today uh, because the exact WLTP CO2 value is still not clear in some EU uh, countries. You know, uh, if I'm informed correctly, it's Germany that already switched to WLTV, uh, WLTP, sorry, and Finland as well. Um, but the, the question of um, our participant here is. Um, why is that? Why is the WLTP still not finalized? And how is it possible that we still get a range of, of CO2 values and there is still no, no common uh, understanding on, on uh, WLTP and, and concrete numbers? Okay, as far as I know, the WLTP, you know, the enforcement is in all the European countries that it has been done. Um, uh, how those kind of enforcements uh, are actually put into national law uh, and what kind of tax incentives are behind that, um, that is a different story. You know, each European country can do what they like. Uh, like what I just explained in length now, Germany has a different kind of taxation law for this than the Netherlands have. And in the Netherlands, I think, Dieter, you're closer to that one. You mentioned that before we went online that there are some distortions in the market also. <laughs> And um, uh, so the, the WLTP is out and the measurements for WLTP for these cars, which are currently sold, meaning they are sold and they are registered, they are all out. You know, I don't know one country where WLTP for a certain car is not determined. They are not able to sell these cars, the OEMs, if they don't have a WLTP value to it. That was one of the reasons why there was a big delay for some of the OEMs uh, last September because they didn't have their paperwork ready and their tests finished. Yes, exactly. But I think the, the question was also related to the, the correlated ADC value that is still being applied as a taxation basis. Uh, that was actually what I was but talking that's about. Calculator. That's a calculator. That's, yes. that's already, uh, this, uh, this correlation is a tool which is available, uh, which was agreed upon the OEMs and all the stakeholders in the European Commission. So 
uh, there's no discussion. That's that's clear. You know, if the WLTP has been confirmed, the uh, the uh, conversion that to the index cycle is already done by a, by a, by an equation and a calculation. Yeah, and in the current correlated NADC values, do we already see um, the reflection of the uh, impact of um, equipment of the vehicle, such as tires? maybe a sunroof, maybe a tow bar, is that already taken into um, um, consideration in the correlated NADC values? As far as, as, far as I know, yes, uh, because it's based on WLTP values. That's the starting point. The WLTP values take those kind of accessories into account. NDEC doesn't do that, but the correlation ca calculation will do it automatically because the NDEC equivalent value is based on the original new WLTP value, which has been measured. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, Tom, I have one more question uh, for you. Um, is it not perhaps the big dealer groups that will have the most power in this landscape of, uh, of forced sales and registrations? Won't they be calling the shots next year as they negotiate with uh, the importers? It's possible it all comes to uh, the countries, different countries and in Europe. Uh, it depends then on the size of the dealers, but it is clear, as, as you said, that bigger dealers uh, might be calling the shots just because they will have their uh, targets on the low emission vehicles uh, with their bonuses, as I mentioned earlier. So they will uh, need those bonuses uh, keep running their businesses. So in order to uh, get these bonuses, they might want to do more volume and they uh, might be calling the shots as to the importers, yes. All right. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Tom Knapkins. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias Pop, um, for your presence, for your uh, expert insights in this uh, very interesting matter. The last word is definitely not set on on this. Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, before you leave us, uh, please um, be aware of the fact that the recorded version of this webinar will be made available online on our website fleeteurope.com and uh, we would also like you to spare a few minutes of your time to answer the satisfaction survey so we can um, improve future webinars um, taking into account your, your feedback of course. Uh, should you have any questions for me you have my contact details right here and uh, once again, uh, Matthias and Tom, thank you very much for your uh, presence and for your insights. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance. And uh, from us here at Fleet Europe, we wish you a very good afternoon. Goodbye. <laughs>